Perfect. Okay, well, thank you all for joining. Um, <clears throat> to, uh, welcome to the March community call. Um, so let's uh, get into it. Um, today's uh, agenda, agenda is not really the right word, pipeline, I like that word. <laughs> um, as per usual, our meetings are meant to be really interactive. Please feel free to um, speak up, raise your hand, just chime in. Um, today, so far, we have kind of a smaller crowd. Um, so feel free to just share or ask questions as you would like. Um, we are going to start off with um, a, a couple updates and announcements, um, and then we'll cover some calls for participation quickly. Um, a lot of this information is stuff that's in our weekly email, but we just like to highlight it in case you didn't get a chance to read the weekly email because there's a lot in there. And then our topics for the day are um, some more documentation tree testing uh, with Annette Greiner. Um, if you were here last time, there was a uh, version one of this and now we're doing kind of the 2.0, I believe. And then um, after that, we will have a talk from our early career award winner, uh, Feng Zhu Zhao. Um, and uh, the talk title is here, Trap Assisted Augur Meitner Recombination from First Principles. Um, so that will take us through the hour. Um, so we do want to start with our with our nug breaker just to get uh, people warmed up and ready to participate. Um, our question today is what recent scientific breakthrough, um, actually the, mine is from last year, it's the end of last year, um, in 2024, are you most excited to see progress? Um, and Charles and I have given hints of our answers here. Um, another hint for mine was that it actually happened at the end of 2023, but we'll pretend it was 2024. Um, does anyone have a guess? Or or you can also answer this for yourself if you'd like to. Yes, participation. What what um, breakthroughs or any scientific advancement is anyone particularly excited about? And I'll go first. For me, it's a lot of the recent... Um, therapeutic advances with CRISPR technology and applying it to different areas. Um, my best friend, he has, um, my mind just went completely blank, but they are working on a sickle cell. He has mm -hmm. sickle cell. So they are, the FDA has approved the first kind of therapeutic treatment based off of CRISPR technology. And and I read yesterday or a couple of days before that, scientists have been able to genetically remove um, HIV DNA from human cells with CRISPR-2. So a lot of advances and a lot of excitement, for me at least. Yeah, mine is, Can any, does anyone recognize what this facility is? It's the National Ignition Facility, or I think it's called it. NIF, right? National Ignition Facility. So this is at um, Livermore Lab. Um, and they this is where they finally got um, a fusion ignition to take place at the in December of 2023. Um, so they were actually able to measure some uh, significant um, fusion reaction taking place or something along those lines. I actually don't remember exactly what it was. Um, but yeah, so this was a huge breakthrough at the end of 2023. And um, I think it'll be really interesting to see. Um, they, finally, I think they've, able, they've been able to recreate it now. So it wasn't just like a one-time thing. This is now they've been able to do it again. And hopefully we'll see more of it um, in the future. Would anyone else like to share? I don't have anything in particular, but I, I dream a really bit controversial, quite controversial dream of scientific breakthrough I was waiting for is to somehow use uh, AI, machine learning technology to accelerate uh, human child behavior development so that uh, uh, you know, small kids start eating vegetables more easily or they don't throw the food they don't like to the floor, or, or they, they listen to parents. And <laughs> things are getting quite slow, I, I, I think. So 
maybe you know we could use some recent technology to accelerate even though that's probably very controversial interesting I, I remember reading an article at the end of last year where i think it talked about how um I believe it might have been in China that it was being used to help assess learning, that they were using um, facial recognition and brain scan technology to determine when, or maybe it was eye scanning, when students were not paying attention. Wow, really? <laughs> Interesting. But is it just that they figured out that they weren't paying attention and that was like, okay, they're not paying attention and, or did oh, they no, have no, a solution? It was, it was really a lot more. Um, right. They were monitored. The, the teachers would be alerted. It was, you know, I'm summarizing at a high level, but it was sure. a pretty much a whole learning um, kind of solution aimed at grade school kids. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Wow. Yeah, maybe someday in the future, raising children will be a little bit easier, <laughs> more technologically advanced. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Koichi. Great. Well, let's move into our announcements so that we have plenty of time for our topics later today. Um, so these are some announcements. These are NERSC-related updates. Um, we have NERSC summer internships available. If you are an undergraduate or graduate student, you can look into... Um, applying for one of those internships if you'd like to come work at NERSC over the summer. Um, we want to let VASP users know that VASP 6 for GPUs is available at NERSC. Um, so if you're a VASP user, we uh, provide you with an application that you can just go ahead and use, um, and we do a lot of work to make it uh, well optimized to run on our machine. So uh, look for that if you're working with VASP. Um, we'd also like to remind everyone to save the date. In, we have our 50th year um, sort of celebration and NERSC uh, user meeting. Um, this is happening in October of this year from the uh, 22nd to the 24th. And if you're interested in helping us with actually planning this meeting, we are looking for volunteers. Um, we do have a pretty good committee already, but we're always looking for more ideas, more interested parties. Uh, to bring their creativity and their enthusiasm. Um, so if you know, if you yourself are interested or you know anybody who's interested, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can also read out, reach out to Charles, but I just put my mine here just for the moment because um, I uh, am kind of spearheading our planning uh, uh, committee. Uh, so if you'd like to participate, just let, let us know. Okay. Um, is there so, a, are there deadlines for the internship applications? Um, that's a good question. I, I'm not entirely sure. Um, we do actually hire interns, um, kind of on a rolling basis at times. So, um, maybe double check in our weekly email if it has a specific date in there. Um, hey, Charles, I can provide some oh. info. There's no, uh, there's no specific date, but like, the sooner the better. Um, and, you know, slots have already filled up for some of the projects that we have, so. Okay, and is there a list of projects? Yeah, so in, in the weekly email, you should be able to see a link in there. Okay, uh, it, it includes I'll look the... back at those, yeah, okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so hopefully there's uh, all, all of the good information in there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Um, so there is um, a call for nominations for the George Michael Memorial HPC Fellowship. Uh, those are open now and due in May. This is to honor a PhD student um, in around the world um, whose research focuses on high performance computing areas. Um, and there is a prize um, uh, with the fellowship. So if you know a student who is a good candidate, uh, maybe direct them to take a look at this uh, call or, or nominate them yourself. There is a call for pro uh, proposals for generative AI for science applications. Um, so this is a nurse call for proposals. Um, and we're lo really looking for people who are gonna be using Perlmutter to um, 
sort of do generative AI research, particularly state of the art research. Um, and if you can, I know that proposals, uh, I mean, the, the, the deadline is pretty close, um, but if you need more information about that, check out the weekly email um, so you can you know, prepare your application in time. Uh, there is a call from the US RSE or US Research Software Engineer Association. Their conference will be in October um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they are calling, they're interested in anyone who'd like to submit a BOF or a BOF is a birds of a feather um, or a workshop or tutorial. And so those submissions are now open and also coming up at April 1st is the deadline. Um, I went to the USRC conference last year and it was a um, very nice conference. It's a kind of a small conference, but I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a great conference to attend, but if you do a lot of research software engineering, you might be interested in um, offering a workshop or tutorial for that uh, conference. Um, there's also a, a NERSC hackathon coming up. So this is a NERSC OLCF NVIDIA hackathon. Um, so if you're interested in participating um, as one of the hackathon teams, um, please submit your application by May 8th. Um, I think these hackathons are a really good opportunity to get a lot of work done on a code that you're trying to accelerate or get uh, ported to GPU. Um, so if you have a code or you know someone who has a code, they've been wanting to get around to setting it up on GPUs, uh, this might be a really good venue for them. Any questions? Uh, just stupid okay. questions, but uh, who is George Michael? Uh, I, I don't know. Finger? Okay. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, actually. Yeah, George Michael was a famous computer scientist um, and he died probably 15 years ago or something, I think. Oh. He's uh, famous for parallel computing stuff. I'm not sure exactly what he did. Okay. Uh, a little bit more serious questions about this uh, hackathon. I never attended these events before, but and they, so we have to submit a proposal first to get accepted. Is that correct? I believe so. Yeah, they want to make sure yeah. that whatever application you're bringing is in a good state that during the hackathon, you could make some good progress. Um, okay. So I think you can, sh you basically, and so they have good information. If you do get accepted, then they can find a good mentor to work with you. So it's really about finding out where your application is at in terms of, um, you know, how, how will the hackathon be helpful to you? Oh, okay, got it. Thank you. At least that's my impression. I don't know. I actually haven't run one before, but that's uh, what I've seen. Great. Okay. Um, if you are planning to use Perlmutter for a Gordon Bell Prize submission, um, you should let us know and you should uh, maybe submit a reservation request um, at least a week in advance um, or as far in advance as you can. Um, you can do this via a ticket. So if you or anyone else you know is planning to um, make a Gordon Bell submission um, and they want to use Perlmutter, we do at, end up having a lot of people being frantic saying, oh, I need to run and I can't get through the queue and I'm trying to run this huge job. Um, so we try to prepare for that by giving people reservations and planning accordingly. So the, the further advance you can give us, the better uh, advance notice you can give us, uh, the better. Um, also, we'd like to remind everyone to keep making use of your allocation, submit jobs on Perlmutter now rather than later. Um, there are reductions that take place um, every quarter. Is it every quarter, Rebecca? Yeah, every quarter. So it's it's going to happen in mid, uh, mid April. Mm -hmm. um, and so right now the queues are very short. And so it's a great time to submit your jobs because most people are behind schedule from what I can gather. Um, and so if you run your jobs now, you'll be able to get them through very quickly versus at the end of the year, if you all recall, we always have really long queue wait times uh, because everybody's trying to use up their allocation. So running now will save you time and yeah, 
it'll be a, it'll be great and everyone will be happy <laughs> so it's great um okay i'm not going to go through every single one of these in detail because um i want to have time for our topics but there is a host of trainings and events coming up um, there's a learning parallel programming with Fortran. Um, Koichi, I know you were talking a little bit about this earlier today, so um, maybe direct users to these trainings. Um, if you know they're interested in Fortran, Dask. Uh, Dask is a tool for, is a Python tool for parallelization and distributed computing. Um, there's a training coming up uh, for that in a couple of days. Um, let's see, there's a debugging challenge debugging challenging memory and gpu problems i thought this is a debugging challenge um that's coming up in may um there are several let's see this is a nurse and end um large language model boot camp so if you're again if you're doing any of the generative ai or the lang language models you might be interested in attending the boot camp um there is ALCF has an AI test bed and um, which is a really interesting system and they're going to have a training workshop. So if you're interested in using their special AI test bed architecture, um, this would be a great workshop to attend. Um, and then this was the uh, hackathon that I mentioned. Um, it, again, if you're interested, the proposals are, oh, is this a different one? This might be a different one, but there's, there's several. So um, yeah, take a look. Um, and then most importantly, we have a couple of maintenances coming up for Perlmutter. Um, so there's a scheduled maintenance on the 17th. Um, it's pretty much for a good chunk of the day. Uh, this is uh, most of the kind of working day on the on the West Coast. Um, so I, I will put these in my calendar so that I would know, okay, I can't sign in. I don't need to submit a ticket. Nothing's wrong. They're just doing scheduled maintenance. Um, so I would put that in your calendar if you are a, a regular Perlmutter user. Um, and then the same on May 15th, um, basically same scheduled maintenance. So um, you there is also probably a link on the live status page to add some of these to your calendar, um, or you can put them in there yourself. Okay, great. Any last questions? All right, well, let's move on to our tree testing part two with Annette. Um, we have about maybe 10 minutes for this. So Annette, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and then take us through uh, today's activity? Okay, do. Thanks, Lippy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm a member of the Data and AI Services Group at NERSC and um, I'm focused on user experience for uh, users at NERSC, and I'm really interested in finding out, uh, you know, kind of how how our users are thinking about the way that we organize information that we make available to them. And one of the ways of doing that is doing this tree testing idea. And uh, the, the idea is to be able to get insight into what would be the best organization of the docs.nurse.gov website um, based on how well people are able to navigate through the tree kind of divorced from the site itself. Uh, you'll see how that plays out in a minute. Um, I think yeah, we could probably just go to the next one. Yeah. So I want to make it clear that we're, we're testing this organization of the user documentation. We're not testing you. So like if you're having trouble working through it, don't feel bad because it, it actually helps us if you have issues and you, you find things that, that aren't quite working quite right. So uh, just have fun with it and, and see if you can find the things we're asking you to find. So well, there'll be 10 brief tasks and each one of them is a thing to find in the tree. Um, and you can quit anytime while you're doing it and you can skip a task if you want. Um, but what happens is when you're done, we get to see the path that you took as you went through the tree. And from there, we can see where people naturally look to find these things. Um, and then I'll give you the URL and the password in the chat. Um, I set up a separate one for staff. So if anyone is staff here and wants to do it, uh, they can go ahead and use that. Um, oh, I just need to grab the chat. And also, I guess, um, 
I could show really quickly what it looks like too, because it'll only take you about three minutes to do it. Um, so if I can share my screen briefly, yep. then yeah, good, good, good. Um, yes. So you should be seeing what it looks like when you pull up the URL. Um, the password is nurse docs. And once you're in there, oh, oh, I did the wrong password. Oh my goodness. What did I do here? Um, hmm. Maybe I'm not on the one I thought I was on. <laughs> uh, oh, this. All oh, right. It's a very small study. Oh, well, I'll just show you on the the real one. <laughs> so there's there's a couple different studies in here, and so I have different passwords for different ones. Okay, so once you're in there, uh, it's going to ask you to enter your name. There's a real brief instructions. So you put your name in there, and then you'll get like the first question, and then you hit start task, and it'll show you the tree. You can open things up and it's only going to let you make a selection on a thing that is an actual leaf node. You can't select something that's uh, higher up on it. That's an actual branch node. So you can skip something just by hitting the skip button. But if you, when it's time to actually say, this is my answer, you hit this, I'd expect it there button. So that's the thing I wanted you to see. All right. And with that, I'll let you fiddle with it. Um, oh yeah, the feedback, uh, at the very end, there's a box for feedback and it seems to not be quite capturing it correctly. So uh, if you do have feedback, I encourage you to use the chat. You can message me directly. So I think I'll give you a few minutes. Uh, people already started on it, I hope. Uh, I didn't see anything in the chat in that. Have you put the link? Oh, I have to hit go. <laughs> there it is. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, if we did this in the last call, should we do it again today? Yeah, please do. It's a little different organization. So what, okay. what we're doing is we, we'll get feedback from one round of testing, and then we'll notice things were wrong, and people had trouble finding certain things. So okay. it's nice to to try to iterate on things and get a, a little bit closer to what is probably a good organization. And over time, we get better and better. OK. So this is where I want to like have the Jeopardy music or something that you'd have in the background. <laughs> oh, Charles, I, I think you're muted. Oh, yeah, I'm just reading to myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Going through that activity. Ah, cool. So the reason for splitting the uh, users and staff into two separate places is that people in the two groups tend to think about some of these questions differently, and we want to be able to understand how much they differ and uh, be able to make sure that we're meeting the needs of both groups, but make sure that we can hear both groups as well.
a general question I might have, Annette, is when you do these um, a study like this, how do you account for maybe like the the demographic of the the user or their background and how that might um, tie into like how they selected in certain spots or is that outside of the scope or that's a little outside the scope of this one um but that's one of the reasons that we're separating staff from users um in order to get enough counts uh mm -hmm. we, we really don't have enough people doing the survey to justify doing separate mm -hmm. uh bins for a lot of a lot of different detailed uh groups unfortunately it would be pretty interesting to see how yeah. i guess the demographic of our users versus mm -hmm. staff and other advanced hpc how they perceive things because i think the more advanced yeah. you are you kind of have an idea of oh i know it's going to be here mm -hmm. so. yeah yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, people who've been working here longer, they pick up the lingo and certain things are more obvious to them if they're labeled with that lingo. So we definitely want to make sure that we're not relying on that knowledge too much. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I want to make sure we um, get time for Feng Shu's um, talk. Um, hopefully everybody got through. I did get through my, uh, mine, but again, I probably, I stopped, maybe went through a little faster. So um, go ahead and finish that up. Um, but I'm going to um, introduce our speaker, um, who's Feng Shu Zhao, who's now a Humboldt Fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Structure, Structural and, Structure and Dynamics of Matter um, in Hamburg, Germany. Um, Let's see. Uh, Feng Zhu um, got uh, obtained his PhD uh, in physics from UC Berkeley, um, and his graduate work consists of topological, electronic, and optical properties of quasi one dimensional nanomaterials like graphene, nanoribbons, and carbon conjugated systems. Um, I don't really know what carbon conjugated systems are. I hope I learn about that soon. Um, and uh, today, Feng Shu is going to be telling us about trap-assisted Auger-Meitner recombination in semiconductors. Um, I'll let you all take a look at this for a moment um, and see all of the great work that Feng Shu has done. And, and you, you might be able to tell uh, why our uh, Feng Shu has uh, uh, received our early career award winner, has done a lot of great scientific work already. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing so Feng Shu can share uh, his slides and his talk and go from there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your introduction. So I, I will share my screen. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. In the presentation yep. mode. Yes. Ready to go. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for the introduction, and and it's really my great pleasure here to give this presentation, and my great pleasure to be awarded the Nurse Early Career Achievement Award. Mm. So, uh, uh, I'm I just. Just uh, now moved to Germany as a Humboldt Fellow, and as introduced uh, introduced here, uh, I was previously a Ealing Price Postdoc Fellow at UC Santa Barbara, and that's where I did this work on trapassist ocean manner recombination. Uh, and previously, I got my PhD from UC Berkeley. Um, uh, so now I will uh, tell everyone about uh, a, a little bit of my work. Maybe from uh, also from a physics physics uh, physics physics point of view, mm. and so first I um, introduce a little about about my background. I got my bachelor degree in Shanghai Jiao Tong University, and then I moved to UC Berkeley, um, where I mostly focus on uh, first principles calculations of excited state 
of nanomaterials. So we use a lot of high performance computing. We used a large uh, scale calculations to uh, simulate the excited state properties of nanomaterials, mm, such as, uh, <coughs> sorry, I, I need to uh, change the, it is always, Okay, uh, so, so, uh, so we use the high performance computing computing resources mostly at NERSC to uh, simulate the excited state of nanomaterials, including electronic properties and optical properties. And one of the uh, material we focused on the most is the graphene nano ribbons, which is um, uh, uh, the one dimensional uh, nanomaterial cut it from a graphene sheet. And I was also uh, a developer of the Berkeley GW code, which we simulate the excited state of nanomaterials. And after that, I, uh, when I was at uh, UCSB, I mainly focused on simulating the recombination process in semiconductor devices. So it's more like an engineering um, uh, uh, application of the physical uh, theory in, and also simulation. Now we, our main goal is to um, uh, improve the efficiency in uh, light emitting diodes. And now I just uh, start uh, my position at Hongbao Fellow and what I'm mo mainly focused on will be uh, light matter interaction. Mm, so uh, uh, so here I, I will introduce a little bit about first principles calculations. We can use first principles calculations to simulate many interesting physical properties of nanomaterials. Uh, here are some examples like in uh, we can simulate the uh, the, the physical property of, of devices such as the recombination uh, process in, in the light emitting process of the uh, uh, light emitting diodes and we can also simulate a lot of uh, uh, novel phenomena in uh, nano electronics such as uh, this is shows a normal electronic state uh, predicted by topological theory in uh, nanomaterials. And the first principles calculation is uh, what we by, mean by first principles is we only use some fundamental parameters in our calculation and we don't use any uh, artificial tuned parameters. So we only use some uh, thing like um, elementary charge of the electrons uh, and uh, the nu nucleus and electron mass of the system to simulate every uh, properties of the uh, material, such as uh, how, how the materials absorb light or how much energy the, um, we can, one need to excite the material to make it uh, make the electron move in the material. Um, uh, we just solved the uh, many body Schrodinger equation um, using these fundamental parameters we, so that we can calculate those properties very accurately. Um, so that's first principles calculations. Um, and uh, for my work here, uh, uh, we focus on the recombination process in optoelectronic devices. And here is why uh, the, well, the simulating the recombination process is very important um, because recombination process is a mechanism that can produce light in the light emitting materials. Um, so, uh, so, it, uh, so if we uh, shine light on a semiconductor device like, like LED, uh, the energy is transferred to the electron carriers in the system so that the electron will be excited from a valence band to conduction band. And sometimes later, the electron in the conduction band will recombine with the valence band uh, holes. Uh, then the energy is transferred to uh, light or other form of energy. So for in, when, transform, when it is transformed to the light, it is the re radiative recombination process, which is useful part of energy. Mm. But it can also transfer energy to the lattice vibrations and we can get rid of them. For example, there are many re non-radiative recombination process like O'Shea Manor process and also many defect assisted uh, non-radiative recombination process. Uh, so uh, our work here uh, is all about how to e improve the efficiency uh, in the um, uh, optoelectronic devices by understanding the mechanism behind them. Uh, so uh, what I will uh, focus on uh, for this work is uh, a non-radiative recombination process called 
uh, trap assess or shape manner recommendation. Um, I would like to uh, explain that uh, this is what people often understand as the uh, OSHA process before. Uh, and uh, the, this rename is to uh, acknowledge the uh, uh, the contribution from the wonderful female scientist, Liz Manner, who actually discovered this phenomenon one year before Pierre O'Shea. Uh, so this is to acknowledge the contribution from her. Uh, this ocean manner recombination uh, is when an electron uh, recombines with the whole carrier in the system, and then the energy is also transferred to another electron. Um, um, so it is a, a, a non radiative recombination process, and uh, it excites another electron to higher energy, or it can also excite a hole to higher energy. So uh, the uh, O'Shea manner process can happen uh, with the free carrier in a box system or also uh, in the semiconductor devices uh, when uh, because uh, the impurity and defect are widely present. Uh, so the impurity can introduce some localized state inside the band gap. Uh, and the O'Shea manner process can also happen involving the uh, localized state inside the band gap. So that's the process we call them as the trap assist O'Shea method recombination. And we abbreviate it as uh, TAM. Um, so in this uh, the outline of my talk will be, uh, uh, we, I will introduce why we want to study this process. This is to solve a, long, uh, 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 a puzzle of uh, understanding the high measured loss in wideband gap semiconductor devices such as LEDs. Um, this has been a uh, many decades uh, puzzle. And uh, I will uh, uh, talk about our theoretical calculation of uh, estimating the rate of this time process. And uh, we present our study on uh, this, this calculation with on calcium uh, substitutional of gallium defect um, in uh, the gallium nitride material, which is the uh, 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 most common material for blue LEDs. And I will present some details uh, and result. Um, so uh, uh, here is an introduction of uh, the uh, how people study the efficiency of the um, uh, semiconductor, uh, semiconductor uh, optoelectronic devices. Uh, people often use the ABC model. Um, so in this model, um, people uh, 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 the, the carrier density of the system uh, little uh, the small n will satisfy this uh, rate equation. Uh, so the first term g is the generation of the carriers due to uh, applying electric field on the system, uh, and there are several different kind of recombination process. Um, uh, which are a different order in the rate in the carrier density. Uh, so linear term is mostly attributed to a mechanism called trap assist multifonal emission. So when there is a trap, uh, there is an impurity or defect in the system, the trap state can assist this, this kind of process, uh, like the electron can be captured at the trap level. And also a whole carrier can be captured at the trap level and uh, all of them together forms a complete recombination cycle. Mm, but this process, uh, they uh, converts energy into uh, lattice vibrations, which, uh, which is a heat, uh, uh, it's non-radiative. Uh, and in this process, because each process only involves one carrier, uh, that's why the rate is the linear order in the carrier density. Um, and the second part is the radiative recombination, which is a useful part of energy um, uh, because in each process, uh, there are two carriers involved, one electron and one hole. Uh, so the uh, rate of this process is second order in the carrier density and it's transferred energy into light. Uh, and there is also the O'Shea manner recombination happened in the bulk. Uh, there are three carriers involved in this process. Uh, this is just the final state of this process. Uh, so, um, so, so the rate of this process is third order in carrier density. And this process will be very important uh, when the uh, power, uh, when the uh, 
uh, current in the system is high, that is in high power uh, electronic devices. Um, uh, and all these three process has been uh, studied, well studied from first principles calculations before, um, but the trap assess or chain manner recombination has not been systematically studied before. Uh, in this process, we can see there are two free carriers involved. Uh, so the, um, uh, uh, the, the rate of this process is second order in the carrier density. Um, yes, uh, so uh, uh, if anyone has questions, just pray free, uh, feel free to ask the question. Um, uh, so here is the, the in experimental motivation of our work um, because the you know, the in indium gallium nitride is the most common material to grow LED, um, to build LED. And from experiments, they have uh, shown uh, low efficiency in both the wet band gap region and low band gap region. And they attribute them to the calcium impurities. So that's why in our study, we all do our calculation uh, as using calcium impurity in gallium nitride as the example. So in our simulation, we built supercell um, uh, to simulate the defect. Here is a calcium impurity, and we can see from our DFT density functional theory calculation, it introduced a localized state inside the band gap. Here is the wave function of the localized state, uh, and. Uh, um, uh, previously, when people calculate the multiphonal emission rate as function of the indium gallium nitride gap, they have found that um, in the wide band gap region, the multiphonal emission rate uh, will decrease exponentially, uh, so that the the rate at the wide band gap region is negligible. Uh, however, in ex the experiment, they still see there are very high loss in this region. Uh, so MPE process cannot explain the high loss in the wide band gap region. Mm. Um, so, so I, I may uh, uh, mention a little bit of uh, why this uh, MPE process cannot ex uh, cannot uh, cannot explain the high measure loss in the wide band gap wide band gap region. Uh, here is uh, uh, the rate of this process is. Uh, because there are two step, steps there. So uh, whichever happens the uh, slower uh, will limit the total rate of this process. Mm, here, uh, uh, so here the, the electron, uh, so the uh, for the calcium impurity, the trap state will be uh, more close to the valence band. So the capture energy for the electron capture process will be larger. Um, and people can use, uh, one can use the, a simple model called configuration coordinate diagram to in uh, to explain the capture process. So the horizontal axis uh, shows the lattice vibrations. Um, uh, so um, uh, so whenever there's a temperature in the system, uh, the system can still have a vibration. So uh, it can go across some energy barrier uh, from the initial state to the capture state. Um, so here is before uh, capture, there are more, uh, there are electron carriers and whole carriers in the system. And after this capture process, one electron carrier is captured to the defect level. Um, and the capture energy is linear proportional to the uh, barrier height. Um, uh, so uh, uh, also the rate will be exponentially proportional, uh, uh, will be exponentially um, decrease on the barrier height. So that's why when the uh, band gap of the system is larger, the electron capture process uh, has a larger capture energy, and then the multiphonal emission rate uh, will decrease exponentially with the barrier height. So that's why um, at the wide band gap region, uh, this process is negligible. Uh, so uh, to uh, to see this uh, to solve this problem of uh, why uh, the system still have a very high recombination rate uh, in the wide band gap region, uh, we want to explore uh, uh, this trap assist or shape manner process. Is, uh, if they can uh, explain this loss, there are also some experimental evidence showing that this process can happen, but they uh, have not been simulated before. Here's a, a schematic plot of this time process. 
when electron recombine with the whole carrier, the whole localized at the uh, Krebs uh, uh, level here, uh, and the energy is transferred to another electron carrier or a uh, whole carrier to excite them to higher energy. Um, so here is our theoretical formalism to intro uh, to uh, incorporate the trouble assist or Shimana recombination process in the semiconductors. Um, so whenever there are uh, the widely present um, the defect uh, is in the semiconductor, um, when the when the trap state are here, uh, both the multiphone emission process and the trap assist or shape manner process will happen at the same time. Uh, so we need to uh, consider all of this process together and calculate the total rate of them. Uh, actually, for the time process, there are four different kind of processes. So for T1 and T4, they are the electron capture process. Um, where uh, and also the energy is transferred to another electron or whole carrier to excite them to higher energy. And T2 and T3 are the whole capture process, uh, and the energy is transferred to another whole carrier or electron carrier. And so we solve a steady state equation to include all of this process. So the total uh, post, total rate uh, will be expressed in this formula, where T and C are just uh, some. Uh, Great coefficient, uh, capture coefficients, uh, independent of the ca carrier density. Uh, it's always linear order in the uh, density of the trap, uh, but um, uh, the dependence of the carrier density is uh, more complicated uh, when it's uh, there's more uh, when the carrier density is high. It is second order in the carrier density, but when the carrier density is low, it may still be linear in the carrier density. Mm, so here is our theoretical formalism uh, to calculate them from first principles. Uh, as an example, here's how we calculate the T1 process. Uh, what we use the Fermi's golden rule to calculate the rate. Mm, here are some uh, matrix elements and also some term to include the, uh, to have the energy conserving uh, conditions in the uh, process. Um, we so. We implement all, uh, uh, my, uh, so I implement the uh, code, uh, uh, this formula in my developed code. Um, uh, we calculate the uh, matrix element using uh, wave functions simulated from um, def uh, density functional software such as uh, Quantum Espresso. And um, uh, uh, here is the uh, the interaction in the involved in this process is the screen to Coulomb interaction, and we have the uh, direct term of this process and the exchange term of this process. Um, so here are some examples um, of the simulated wave functions um, of the ground state property of um, uh, gallium nitride with the impurity calculated from uh, DFT code like a quantum quantum expresso. And we, in our code, uh, we just uh, use this wave function and, and the energy eigenvalues to uh, inter, uh, to integrate them to calculate the t, uh, t coefficients. And also there are many uh, details to uh, uh, deal with because uh, uh, it's hard to simulate the process with the both localized state and the extended state. Mm, uh, so, uh, uh, a very important uh, uh, problem to uh, solve to make our uh, calculation um, uh, uh, accurate is to um, test the convergence with supercell sites because we can only use a relatively small supercell in our calculation. Uh, so to make the uh, um, uh, calculated results um, uh, accurate, uh, it's, so it's uh, it's very hard to simulate the uh, extended bulk state in the system. Uh, so one way to solve this problem is to test if our calculated result doesn't depend on the supercell size, then our uh, calculated results should be um, reasonable. Uh, so here is our test of convergence. We uh, pl plot the time coefficient as function of different supercell sites in our simulation. Uh, we can see uh, uh, here the results calculated in a 360 atom supercell 
is already a converged result. Um, uh, here we don't need to uh, converge the result in, uh, in a very accurate number because we only need to estimate the orders of magnitude of this time process. So here, uh, this uh, this supercell is already a very good convergence. Um, so after the convergence Bang test, mm -hmm. can I ask a question? Uh, okay, sure. Or do you want me to wait? Uh, yeah, please ask. Please. Um, please ask. I see in your supercell that impurity is like not centered in the cell. Is there a reason for that? Like, do, uh, is supercell symmetric, or should it not be uh, symmetric? Uh, the supercell is periodic uh, in uh, in the all the three dimensions. So uh, so it doesn't matter where we put the uh, impurity here. Is they are all periodic structure. Uh, so okay. Yeah yeah. Uh, so it's uh, totally uh same if we just put this uh, um impurity here or here and uh, anywhere they are just. But is uh, is the calculation done like? Uh, with with the impurity at like the origin and then you sort of integrate out from there or does that not really matter uh i think it uh, doesn't matter uh, okay we, because everything is a periodic structure so uh i can put the impurity anywhere uh, in the supercell um, okay yeah, but this is, is like the bulk of the material so you're not looking at the edge or anything because it would be yeah, yeah, yeah. if it didn't it is, extend uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. that's a, just a bulk of the material. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. Yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, maybe this plot is a little, a little confusing because actually we can put the uh, impurity anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so here is a, our calculated result after a uh, test of convergence. We can see all these four um, time coefficient. Uh, almost in the same similar order 10 to the power of minus 30 per uh, centimeter uh, to the power of six per second um and the uh, t2 and the t3 has uh, a, a weaker dependence on the indium gallium nitrate gap in the system because they are elect uh, yeah, they are the whole capture process the capture energy uh, of this whole capture process almost um are almost independent of the indium content. Uh, and the T1 and T4 process uh, has uh, stronger dependence on the indium gallium nitrate gap because they, they are the electron capture process where they can have wilder dependence on the uh, indium content. Um, and we can plug in the calc our calculated result uh, to show the total um, recombination rate, including both the trap assist ocean manner process and multiphonal emission. So here is our uh, final result. Uh, we can see that in by inclusion of the uh, time process, um, the uh, rate will be orders of magnitude larger than the multiphonal emission rate alone um, in the wide band gap region. Um, so, and to be uh, specific, uh, in the gallium nitrate region, uh, the our calculated rate, including time and MPE, uh, is uh, over 11 orders of magnitude larger than the MPE rate alone. Uh, so this clearly, clearly shows that this uh, time process is very important in uh, um, in uh, limiting the efficiency uh, in the wet band gap region. Uh, and also our calculated result has a qualitatively match with the experimental measurement. Well, we may say that our calculated results agree with the experiment uh, within uh, of roughly one uh, uh, within the orders of magnitude because in experiment is also very hard to um, uh, measure this process uh, very accurately. Mm. And also uh, uh, according to our further test uh, with different kind of uh, uh, impurities or defects, uh, the total, uh, the time rate uh, doesn't depend very strongly on different kind of uh, defects. Mm, so here is basically uh, how our uh, developed code works. We read in the uh, density functional ground state calculations uh, in both the uh, supercell calculation and unicell calculation because uh, both some uh, both 
um, there are something needed from list calculations and we can uh, calculate the uh, T coefficient. Um, so our developed uh, code is a parallelized Fortran code. Um, so uh, it uh, can deal with the system with very large supercell. Um, the bottom leg of the calculation is not uh, calculating the time coefficient, but to simulate the um, uh, ground state property using the uh, supercell calculations um, if uh, accurately. Mm, and our code is also working for spinless uh, spin polarized system or uh, also work for spinner calculations. Uh, so here's the summary. Um, we have developed a methodology to calculate the time process from first principles. And we discovered that this is uh, the time process is very important in limiting the loss in uh, wet band gap semiconductors. Um, uh, and also, uh, so um, I also, uh, for this process, uh, uh, for this work, I also won another prize in the inter International Conference in Defect in Semiconductors. Um, and finally, I would like, I would like to thank uh, thanks, uh, uh, NERSC for providing a uh, very nice computational resource for this. So, so this all this work is uh, supported by the calculation uh, in NERSC. Um, uh, and I'll also thank my postdoc advisor, Professor Chris Vanderbilt, uh, in uh, this work. And, and thank you thank you very much for your attention. And uh, please uh, feel free to ask me questions. Thank you, uh, Fangju. That was a really nice talk. Are there any questions? I guess I'm curious how, how when you did your calculations on um, Corey and then on Perlmutter, did you notice a significant improvement in speed up or were you were your runs kind of similar in time and how much um, of the machine you used? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, actually, uh, uh, this work, when we are doing this work, uh, all the work is run on the Corey because okay. at that time, uh, Corey was not retired yet, okay. and we, we didn't run a, a lot on prom, promoter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah, that's great, yeah. that's great. Yeah. That's great. Can I just ask another technical quick question? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, you know, when you wrote your code in the previous uh, slide, you mentioned you used the yeah. Fortran, you wrote a parallel Fortran code, and I'm just curious, uh, uh, why did you, <laughs> Uh, choose this specific language for Tran instead of other languages. Are there any other I don't know, historical reasons in your science community to use Fortran, or did you have any specific other specific reasons? Uh, so, so, uh, so, so you're asking why we use Fortran to implement everything? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, because uh, in uh, in our field, uh, most of the first principles calculation code are written by Fortran. So, like the quantum espresso that we uh, read, read uh, the wave functions and the energy of from the uh, this code is written in Fortran. Uh, so that will be uh, more compatible to do this. So, uh, also in uh, when we are calculating excited state properties using Berkeley GW code. Uh, that code is also written in Fortran. That's also uh, that code also written in uh, the ground state properties of uh, calculated by quantum espresso, and uh, and then calculate the excited state properties. Uh, so that's why we choose Fortran. I see. Okay, this one full of questions. But, um, do you know how old is this quantum espresso code? Is is it like ten years old, five years old, or ten years old? Order. Uh, uh, I think the, the the first version of quantum espresso, uh, first public version maybe in the uh, around two thousand and five or or um, maybe, uh, I am not exactly sure about the exact uh date, but I think uh, uh because their first paper comes from uh in around two thousand and five, so uh. 
their first development of this code must be uh, many years before that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just curious because sometimes we struggle to combine very old legacy Fortran code with more modern code, and particularly for our generation. Even with the same Fortran, if I look at the Fortran 77 mm -hmm. code without any comments, I just don't understand. So I was wondering, curious if you had a similar problem uh, in your own uh, coding. Uh, probably not as bad, I guess, if you the uh, as a code uh, written in mm -hmm. 2000-ish. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's not that bad. Uh, uh, used, I think we don't have any compatible uh, problem of the Fortran version or uh, the code of uh, the version of the code during this process. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And I did a, my my field is different, but I yeah, I think it's really complex. Great work. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm, yeah, no problem. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, if anyone has more questions, um, if you would like, you could probably reach out to Feng Shu. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Please feel free to ask me questions if you have any further questions. Thank you very much. Right. Well, that concludes our um, community call for today. Thank you so much for joining. Um, as per usual, um, if you are interested in, uh, let me just, if you're interested in, um, in suggesting a topic or uh, want to participate further, um, let us know. Um, and we have some forms here to uh, let us know if you're interested, but it might be easier to just contact us, me or Charles, um, if you're interested in having a specific topic uh, for a community call. So thank you so much, and we will see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye